Everyone loves tier lists. I made a two and a half hour long tier list video, racking the viability of every single Pokemon in Vintage White for Nuzlocke King. That video was pretty well received, so it's time to make another one. This time I'll be discussing in great depth every single Pokemon Raw Mac I played, and I'll be ranking them based off overall quality in my opinion. In total, I played about 25 different ROM hacks, all of them were Nuzlocke, not including random demos and games that I barely put any time into. And I have a lot of knowledge and experience on Nuzlocke and just ROM hacks in general. My best Nuzlocke feats include Hardcore Nuzlocke every Drano game at least twice, including the very recent brand new Blaze Black and Volwick 2 Redux which I've been twice with extra Hardcore Nuzlocke rules. Making me literally like one of the very first few people in the planet to do so, because the game like literally just came out. I also hardcore nuzlocke Fire Red Omega without a single death. That's right, being the whole game without losing a single mon. Renegade Platinum, I made it past Gym 8 without any losses throughout the whole game. I've also been Vintage White 6 times with even harder hardcore nuzlocke rules, including nuzlocke the even harder post game, with the post game rematch being even harder than the original Elite Four. I've also beaten the Elite Four in Radical Red Restricted Mode without losing a single Mon, and I'm currently right now at the late game in the pretty insane Radical Red Hardcore Mode. Just to be in perspective, Radical Red Hardcore Mode is about comparable in difficulty to Emerald Kaizo, just to be in perspective, so I know what I'm talking about. Now, it needs to be said, what this tier list video will and will not be, along with my ranking criteria and why I'm doing what I'm doing. There will be discussion for sure, disagreements and debates, uh, some of my takes will be really controversial, and I'll be explaining every game in great detail. But this list will be ranking games based off of these features for me. My personal enjoyment that I got from the game, accessibility for Nuzlocke, plot, lore and writing, and exploration, content, replay value, balance, other things as well. The important thing is that while I Nuzlocke and that's my preferred way of playing Pokemon, not all Pokemon games are about Nuzlocke, some are more plot driven, some are great for casual play, and there's more to these games than just Pokemon battling. Remember that Pokemon games are role playing games, so they're similar to Elder Scrolls or Fallout, they should be compared to such. So there are 25 different ROM hacks that I've played pretty extensively that I'll be talking about in detail. The games that I'll be talking about are Pokemon Blaze Black and Volvite 2 from Driano, Pokemon Kanto Black, Pokemon Blaze Black and Volvite 2 Redux, Emerald Kaizo, Crystal Clear, the game that shall not be mentioned, I actually don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this game on YouTube, Crystal Dust, Dark Rising, Pokemon Adventure Red Chapters, Emerald Omega, Driano's Fire Red Omega, Pokemon Gaia, Light Platinum, Liquid Crystal, Unbound, Blazing Emerald, Nameless Fire Red Project, Radical Red, Snakewood, Driano's Storm Silver, Driano's Volt White, Renegade Platinum Baby, Pokemon Challenges Emerald Trash Lock, Primeval Black 2 which is currently in beta, and Vintage White which is made by Suiku, who's actually Pokemon Challenge's moderator, I think. So, with that established, here are all the games I'm talking about. Here's the criteria that I'll be using while I'll be racking these games off of. I'll be splitting them up into tiers from S+, which is basically almost literally perfect 10 out of 10, going down to amazing S tier, very good A tier, good B tier, mid C tier, and bad D tier. So that makes sense. Be racking them off of overall quality, here are all the games. Let's get into the tier list, and I know there will be disagreement on a lot of my opinions, but even though we might disagree, I'll be explaining very clearly why I think the way I do, and potentially playing devil's advocate for my own argument, so if you disagree with me, I mean you can tell me in the comment section, we can have some discussion, but even then, hopefully you can at least understand why I think the way I do, just so we're on the same page, so onto the tier list. So the first game, now, Volt White 2. In Blaze Pack 2. Now, what I did, this is including the Redux version, so there is no official box art for Blaze Black and Volt White 2 Redux. So, what I'm doing is Volt White 2 is going to be the base of Volt White 2, the old game from Driano. Blaze Black 2, this is going to be Blaze Black 2 Redux, the new game from EP Hex and Driano, just to clarify that. So, 
Beast Volway 2, the old one. Honestly, this might actually be Driano's weakest ROM hack, or second weakest, and I will get to that soon. It's a very dated game, and it was remade for a very good reason. The advantages, it's still a Driano game. It still has a lot of good stuff, difficulty settings. It's still a black and white 2 game, which is really hard to beat because it's just the best vanilla game. But it's not that much better than the base black and white 2 anyways. The negatives, um, yeah, there's quite a few. This is when, you can really tell this is Driano's earlier work. The balancing is really off. A lot of the mons are barely balanced. A lot of the mons just suck. The AI is really jank. It undid a lot of the amazing changes that Blaze Black and Vote White 1 did. I think this game might have actually been made first, so that might not apply to it. Also, the Elite Four champion were pretty disappointing. There's a lot of really broken mons like the Gift Zoroark. Post game Elite Four rematch and champion rematch were really disappointing because they were literally just the exact same teams, which is a higher level. And that I think is a really big mistake. As somebody who really enjoys playing post game, post game enjoyer, I don't finish my Nuzlocke until I've been everything, including the champion rematch. I expect the Elite Four and champion rematch to be something absolutely wild. I want to see legendaries. I want to see like higher level, yes, obviously, but you're just going to grind that higher level anyway, so it doesn't even matter. I want to see them really be souped up. I really want it to be like the true ultimate challenge. I don't want to just do the same team again, but a little bit higher level. That's something that Base Platinum did and it was really dumb in that game. It's like, what's the point in just fighting this boss fight again? I've already beaten. It's like, oh, they're higher levels. Like, okay, I'll just rear candy up to the level enemies. It doesn't matter. And obviously, how can I not mention him? Gym 1 split. Like, what the hell is that? Cheren, it's like, if you don't get Lucario, there's like a 90% chance that you just wipe. Like, how's that fun? <laughs> that is just ridiculous. That being said, it's still a good game. So I'll put somewhere in good. Now, as I put more games in this list, it'll be easier for me to kind of order them within the tiers because I can sort of like visualize where the games are in relation to other games. So that's a pretty important point. But speaking of Blaze Black and Vol White 2, Blaze Black and Vol White 2 Redux. Now this, the remake, in case you for some reason have not played this yet, it is significantly better than the game it was remaking in a lot of ways. It fixes a lot of the issues. It takes a lot of inspiration from Vintage White in the harder Driano games, which is really good. It has very nice features, a lot of new balancing, a lot of really impressive new plot and new cutscenes. Fairy types are added, new moves, I believe. Yes, like Wave Crash. A lot of new balancing, new gym leaders. The Elite Four and Champion are so much better. Double battles, triple battles, single battles. Iris has legendaries. And then, post game. Oh, post game is absolutely insane in this game. It's really well done. There are so many brand new cutscenes in like new NPCs like Cynthia, Cyrus. All these um, Jojo characters are there. Every single legendary is obtainable. So many new things that were not available in the base Black and White 2 is really creative what the ROM hacker was able to add to this game. It was very nice. It still has problems. It still has balance issues. For some ungodly reason, um, Cheren Split is still a complete mess. It's like if you don't get the right mons, you just lose. Or it's just like a dice roll and that's it. That is just not fun. There's also some really jank balancing. Some mons just could not... They weren't as balanced as well as they should be. Like Renegade Platinum, I feel a better balance for individual mons. And there isn't too much replay value. Because certain mons like Infernip and Sceptile, the guaranteed gift mons, they're just over-centralizing and they're too good. And you will take those mons every single time. There is no reason to ever pick a Swampert over a Sceptile. There is no reason to ever not pick an Infernape at Drift Fail for your gift, for example. Things like these make it so you'll be getting the same mons almost every run, and that does really diminish that replay value and also the balance. It does make things a little bit boring. Also, things like Invictini and Cobalion are really, really good. Like, of course, you, 
you could choose not to use them, but it's not my job as a player to balance the game for the developer. The developer put that there for the player to use. But it's still a good game. I would probably put this in very good, but maybe on the lower end. I'll see what other games I put there and kind of balance it from there. Now next up, this is Canto Black, which I'm pretty sure the vast majority of you have not played this game. I think this game is very underrated and I recommend this to a lot of people. Now, first of all, what is Canto Black? It's a pretty modern Fire Red ROM hack. But what it changes is, it's basically completely Unova. It's Fire Red, but everything is just Gen 5 now. In the Kanto region, you can only get Gen 5 mons. That's all there is, and they're updated with um, very, very few stat changes. All, almost none, and like one or two ability changes. So it's pretty authentic, and physical special split is there. So it's a pretty authentic experience to the base Unova in Kanto. But there's also a lot more changes on top of that. For example, like all the NPCs, for example, have Unova mods, obviously. But what I really like is how it's implemented in the lore, the lore, in the world building. It really fits this Unova theme really well. For example, every single instance of a Cantomon being mentioned in the base Fire Red is replaced with an appropriate Unova mon. For example, um, Selfie, not Selfie, um, the girl in the Berry Forest, instead of getting jumped by a Hypno, she gets jumped by a Malamar. In other cases, like for example, instead of Marowak in Pokemon Tower that jumps you, it's a Minchino that lost its baby Chinchino. Or no, Chinchino lost its baby Minchino, yeah. In other cases where, for example, in Peter City, there's a trainer who has a Rattata. It's like, hey, look at my Rattata, does this, and then does a Rattata cry. This time it's been replaced with a with a purloin, it has the purloin cry, and there's so many more cases of this, which I think is really nice. It really makes it feel like the Unova mons belong, because they're also put into situations where they make sense. Even like, for example, at Safari Zone, where there's, there's like the Kangaskhan, and the Lapras sprites, and the NPCs that talk about them, they're replaced with Unova mons now, and it makes it feel like the Unova mons actually fit. Also, there are things that uh, gym leaders have been changed to match the Unova types, which is something that I kind of liked in the base black and white original is that it just revolved around this completely new pokedex and this is my one of my first experiences actually using unova mons properly misty is now an ice type gym leader to make up for the fact that ice isn't that good so laurel is going to be a water type user instead and i believe blaine is a normal type specialist because there are not many gen 5 fire types one big thing to say and one of the things that i really enjoyed about this game and probably the biggest thing about it is that Kalos is in this game. You can get Gen 6. Now, there are many, many changes to the base game. For example, Wonder Eggs are available in Pewter City. You can get Wonder Eggs. In Wonder Eggs, they can include Gen 6 mons. And another really, really big thing that I really enjoyed. Sevi Islands have been completely re reworked. You can go to the Sevi Islands before the 4th gym. And that is huge. The Sevi Island quest has been reworked, so you can do the first set of Sevi Island quests with Bill before Erica. And the Sevi Islands contain Gen 6 mods, and that is just he This was incredibly fun to do. This idea of just you beat Lieutenant Surge, you have access to all these areas before Erica, and you have access to free islands to explore. It was so fun to Nuzlocke. You get so many encounters, so many mods to use that I never get to use before, and so much to do in. It's non-linear as well, which is something that I really enjoy. I feel like it's just underrated. And then, right before Gym 8, you get access to the second Sevi Island quest, where you go to find the Ruby, and you get access to Island... I think you get access to Island 4, 5, and 6, which is really, really big. You get access to all 6 islands before the Elite 4, and then in post-game, there's a 7th island, and there's also new content. There's also a very big battle facility you can do, which is really nice. It's basically Battle Frontier from Emerald, but even bigger. It's really impressive with the ROM Hacker Mash add in. Now, the difficulty for ROM hacking, it's easy and hard at the same time. I recommend you don't use docs. 
otherwise the game will be too easy, but there's some difficulty, but it's not that much. It's probably like Driano level of difficulty, I would say. But if you're not using docks, you're not calcing that often, you're just playing nuzlocking it on your own. There's a lot of enjoyment to be had with this game, honestly. I think it's really well made. I would put this in very good. I might actually put this like... I'll probably put this above the base of a white tube, but below Blaze Black 2 Redux. So I'd probably put this at the very top of good for now. I'll talk about Emerald Kaizo after this, because Emerald Kaizo... It's going to be very controversial with my take on this. People will be salty. Pokemon Crystal Clear now. My opinion on this is going to be a bit shorter because I spent a lot of time talking about uh, Candle Black. I feel like this game is good to mid. And I know people won't say, oh, this game is so good, it's good. Yes, you're not wrong. The game has a lot of qualities, absolutely. As somebody who loves non-linearity in Pokemon games, I actually like to role-play in my role-playing games. Imagine that. People forget that. Pokemon are role-playing games. This game has so many awesome things. The ability to pick like 10 different starters, each with advantages and disadvantages, unless you pick like um, Smeargle, which just sucks. The ability to all the gyms in any order, main game E4, post game E4, additional content. This sounds amazing, and it is. So what's there not to like? The only thing that's not to like is Generation 2. Gen 2 sucks. I do not like anything before Game Boy Advance. It's so dated. It looks like garbage. It sounds like garbage. The interface is so bad, I can't even see what's doing. Like I, I can't even see like what's happening. There is kind of a learning curve. Like if you were like if you were like a teenager in the 1990s, you'll probably more, be more used to this, but I just don't like this. Now I think graphics in a Pokemon game and video games in general don't really matter. But I do feel there has to be some kind of minimum threshold first. I feel Gen 3 was like a good baseline for graphics. After Gen 3, graphics didn't really matter that much. Gen 3, the graphics were clear enough. I could see everything. It looked fine. I could know what I was doing. Anything before Gen 3 though, it's just like, it's just a mess. It's all black and white. The sprites look, everything looks ugly. I can't really see properly what's happening. The soundtrack is pretty bad. It's just really confusing. That was something that I really did enjoy. I will say, if this game wasn't Gen 3, which I think there is an equivalent version of Gen 3 for Emerald and Fire Red, then yes, it would be a very good game. If this game was ported to Gen 3, it would absolutely be an amazing game. But because of Gen 2 and its limitations, I would say probably top of mid, because it's not a game that I would choose to play. I played it once, had some fun with it, but I'm not going to play it again, unfortunately. Which is a shame because I absolutely love the open world nature of it. More games should be doing that. Now. <laughs> oh, this is a good one now. Emerald Kaizo. Get your pitchforks ready, people. People look. This game gets pedestalized. People say Emerald Kaizo, it's so good. It's amazing. It's a go to masterpiece. I think this game is not very good. And I know everyone's going to be upset over that. Well, a lot of people will. I think this is going to be very divisive. 50% of people completely pestilize this game. The other 50% of people think it's bad. I would say this game is good or mid. And wait, why is... There needs to be C tier. That's better. I think this game is mid. And there's a lot to talk about. Emerald Kaizo is not a game that I enjoy playing. It's not. The game is extremely hard. It's one that is probably the hardest ROM hack out there. But I feel like people, they get the wrong idea. They pestilize the game because it is hard. See, Emerald Kaizo is amazing because it is hard. Not because it is a good game. Being hard does not make something a good game. Dark Rising is hard. Does that make it a good game? Absolutely not. And a lot of people, they trash on Dark Rising for having certain RNG traits in it and certain obnoxious game design. But when Emerald Kaizo does it, it gets praised. Like, why? Emerald Kaizo, it has S tier traits, but it also has D tier trash traits as well. I like the design of a lot of the fights. I like how a lot of the fights, they're like puzzles that force you to plan for them. And there's some really good balancing that I like in the game. Like for example, Sunflora is actually useful for once. And accuracy buffs, that was a very good feature. But it also has really bad features like 
annoying puzzles and forcing you to backtrack and just making the game a slog to navigate. And I really, really hate the two things I really hate about this game. The amount of RNG. Why does every trainer have to have self-destruct and quick claw and bright powder? That is not fun. I don't want to have a 10% chance of losing my best mon every fight just because the game chose to. Or like, the, the AI just decided to boom turn 1. Or like, I have to constantly play around solar beam AI because that's a thing where the AI can use random moves in the sun. I don't want to play around that. RNG is just incredibly obnoxious. And probably the main thing I don't like about this game, my main point is, why play this game? This game is not accessible to 99% of people. Emerald Kaizo is a game that only appeals to people who, whose lives revolve around Nuzlocking. Twitch streamers who are getting paid to play this game hours and hours a day. If you're an average Joe, this game is not for you. It is not a particularly fun game. And the real point is, this game is such a slog to play. The game is trainer after trainer after trainer after trainer. All of which have 5, 6 mons with items that you have to prepare for. For example, the gap between Gym 3 and Gym 4. You have to go from Marvel City all the way up to Fallobor Town. There's literally 20 trainers in between and you have to prepare for all of them. Even the easier ones. You still have to prepare because if you don't prepare, you could accidentally get hit by some unexpected coverage move or some item, for example, or one of them might have self-destruct and you still have to prepare for them, otherwise you're going to lose someone. And this game is so unforgiving to misplace, you have to prepare for everything. Then after Falibur, after Lava Ridge Town, Falibur Town, Falibur Town, yes, there's like three more trainers you have to fight, you still have to prepare for them. Then there's a 10 trainer magma gauntlet, you have to prepare for all of them. Then there's a few more trainers. Then there's Mount Chimney. You have to fight another five trainer magma gauntlet. One of which is Tabata, who's a pretty hard boss fight. Then you have to do Maxi, who's a very hard boss fight. Then you have to go through Jagged Pass, which is another gauntlet. Then you have Flannery, which is another like 10 trainer. It's like seven trainer gauntlet. That's even harder. It's like, why is there 40 trainers here? all requiring me to prepare for them. It takes hours to do. 90% of the game is you calking and prepping and looking at docks. I, I want to play, the, I want a game that's hard, but I want to play the game too. I don't have to study for a game like it's an exam. The YouTuber DRXX, or he's a, the Twitch streamer, I mean, he's a YouTuber as well. He beat Emerald Kaizo on his third attempt, which is absolutely wild. How long, guess how long it took him to do that one attempt though? One month. I think even more. It took him like five weeks just to do one attempt. And he's a, a Twitch streamer who gets paid to Twitch stream. He can actually make money off of it. And he has way more time than the average person. He can actually dedicate his life to this. The average person is not going to be able to do that. People have lives. I, nobody wants to come home from a hard day at work and be, okay, let me spend five hours looking at damage calcs just so I can get through Magma Hideout. And I still end up wiping to self-destruct AI anyways. And the main, the main point, the final point about Emerald Kaizo, I'm going to move on, is the game's just so outdated. If I, you want a really hard ROM hack, why should I play Emerald Kaizo when Radical Red exists? If you want a hard game, play Radical Red Hardcore mode. And I'll be getting to Radical Red and I'll be explaining that in a second. Play Primeval Black 2. And the final big rebuttal on me, people will say, oh, you're just being a hater, this game, it's supposed to be annoying. What kind of stupid are you? How, 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 how stupid do you have to be? It's okay that the game is, is badly designed because it's supposed to be badly designed. That's like saying, that's like saying the Star Wars sequel trilogy was supposed to be bad, so it's not bad. Like, that, that makes no sense. It's still a detriment to the game, and it's still something to critique. By that logic... Emerald Kaizo was actually not designed to be Nuzlocked at all. It was designed around just normal play, so like, the game shouldn't even be Nuzlocked at all if you're using that argument. So yes, we're done with Emerald Kaizo. If you want to talk more about it, you can mention the comment sections. I know people are going to have a lot to say about it, but yeah, I've said my piece about it. Now, speaking of controversial games, the game that shall not be named. 
Now this might even be more controversial than Emerald Kaizo. People are not going to, some people are going to really like what I got to say, some people really not like, like what I got to say. But it's got to be said. Now, this game here, before I put it on my, on my list, I'll put it here for now. This game, I understand completely that this game, it's not for everyone. It is not for everyone. It has a very particular kind of humour. I think the humour is very hit and miss. It's like 80% hit, 20% really miss. And it has a very, a certain edginess to it. It's a very adult, the game is not meant for children, it flat out tells you. I understand that a lot of people will just be turned off by it and they will not like it, or some people might even get offended by the game. That is fine, I understand why you might think that. I do not hold that against you. The problem I have is when people, they don't like the bad humour of the game. And they, 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 just, they just dump on the game, say, the game is objectively garbage because of it. The game is objectively trash. That is wrong. The game is objectively amazing. There is so much to love. I really enjoy the plot, the gameplay, the Pokemon, the bouncing, the world building, the exploration, the soundtrack is incredible. Some of the memes are awesome. Senator Armstrong is a Pokemon in this game. There is a Pokemon called Sun Nanos. Let the, Broly is a gym leader. Let that sink in this game. Telekino City is probably the best city I have seen in any Pokemon game. The post game is the best post game I have seen in any Pokemon game. It's probably the best part of any Pokemon game I've ever played. This game has so much to love. The champion twist. Oh my god, the meta the meta reference of who the champion is is probably one of the best twists I've ever seen in any video game. And I am being real with you. People are gonna hate on this game. But they haven't even played it fully. They, they just look at the offensive humour and they just dismiss the whole game. If you don't like the offensive humour, that is fair, I understand. But don't say that the game is just objectively garbage as a whole because of that, because that's objectively wrong. When creating a game, you look at the good things and you look at the bad things. There could be good things about a game that you like and bad things as well. You don't have to completely be one side or the other. But I truly think, think this game's incredible. Some of the humour can be a bit cringy. Absolutely, but some of the humor is very good. Like the Shadow the Hedgehog references were funny. Some of the jokes were just, they, they really made me laugh. Also because they, I understand meme culture more than other people. And people say the Pokemon are garbage. Yes and no, some of the Pokemon are really miss. I won't lie, but some of the Pokemon are absolutely amazing and I will show some of them. Some of these Pokemon could absolutely pass for official Pokemon. And people will say, oh, the Pokemon's game suck. But I guarantee you, if I showed you these Pokemon, and you did not know that they came from this game here, you would say these were good Pokemon. There's so much to love. It also has... It's a very hard game. It has the CRFU that Radical Red has. So boss fights are really rough. And I really love the end of post-game. One of the big complaints I had about this game is that the plot does not kick in until the end of post-game, which is really weird. But when your plot does kick in, that final dungeon, the soundtrack, the final boss, and the message he has about about social values, it was really good. It actually made me feel things, which I've never felt in a Pokemon game, well, very rarely. It was really well written. The only issue was that it just came out at the last second, and they could have done a lot more with it. And the world building is my favourite bit. This world is like this meta concept that... This was a world that was made by like him. Like the villain literally created this world and that's why it's so full of memes. And just the amount of content, the amount of exploration, non-linearity. Post-game it's like, here's seven islands, six new gyms. There's literally one city with 200 NPCs in it. And so many buildings with multiple four. There was so much to do, so much exploration. There was so much to do in this game that's not Pokemon battling. And that is one of the things that really sets this game up. It's a full video role-playing game. It's not just go here, battle him, go here, battle him. There's side quests, there's fetch quests, there's lots of dialogue, there's lots of like fun mini games where you can like play like pachinko and like you can talk to NPCs and they have jokes. There's like a there's like a you can literally bike race in this game. There's so much to do and the amount of work in this game is staggering. If you don't like this game for what it stands for, I understand, but give it a chance. Look at the positives in the game, okay? 
don't, don't, don't just be negative. And, and the final point I want to say is, people want to say, oh, you're a bad person if you play this game. No, that's a load of rubbish. We're all adults, we're all grown-ups. It's not my responsibility to not talk about this game. I like this game, there's nothing to be ashamed of. If you don't like the game, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with talking about it. There's nothing wrong with liking this game. You shouldn't feel bad for liking this game. People are going to get in their high horse. I'm not going to really go into that very much, but let's just be civil about this game. So I've said my piece about this game. So yes, take it or leave it. The next one here is um, Crystal Dust. Actually, getting hard to see. This is Pokemon Crystal Dust. So yeah, this I'll, I'll, I'll put this in goated for obvious reasons that I just mentioned there. Crystal Dust. This, if you, there's a YouTuber called Mr. Ding Dong Games. And um, he's the only YouTuber who's actually made a YouTube video on this game. And I've played this myself because of him. I also have a pretty similar accent to Mr. Ding Dong Games, some of you might notice. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of name is Mr. Ding Dong anyways? Who the hell will call, him, call themselves that anyway? That's kind of funny. But uh, Crystal Dust. It, it's actually a game that I like. It's lower tier, but I still like it. Now, what this game is, it's, a, it's basically Pokemon Crystal ported very faithfully onto Gen 3. So there are Gen 3 mechanics like IVs and EVs and I think natures and abilities that weren't in Gen 2, but it's very similar to the original Gen 2. The boss fights and the balancing is kept intact in the original game. The soundtracks are ported over and I really like the soundtracks in Gen 3 and I really like this game because I played this game when I was relatively new to Nuzlocking and this was my first Johto experience overall, my first time really using Gen 2 mons. And it felt like it was a new game, and I liked it. And the problem I had with Crystal Clear, like I said, I hate Gen 1 and Gen 2, they suck. They look like garbage, the balancing, the grinding, it's the, there's a mess. But this, Gen 3, is good, it works. It's not perfect, but, you know, Gen 3, at least it looks like a game. Now the problems are, a post-game was not finished, so the content was very limited. And obviously, like, a lot of the problems from Gen 2 were still there, like, grinding was annoying. The, the gym leader teams, like, what were the gym leader teams? And, uh, like, there's, like, no TMs and the bouncing, and so many Pokemon are just garbage. Like, like, you know this is some crazy stuff when a Rhydos and Ledian are work. They make Beedrill and Butterfree look good. Like, what? A Rhydos is the regional bug type. It's so bad, it makes Beedrill look useful. Like, Whoa. There's like 100 mons, but only 50 of them are Johto fully evolved mons. I should think even less. And like, almost all of them suck. And like, the only ones that are good are like available in post game, which isn't even in this game. So, there's still a lot to like. I'll probably put it like on the bottom end of my list. I think, on the bottom end of my list. But it's still a game I enjoy. Oh, Dark Rising. <laughs> Dark Rising time. Um. This game is absolutely something. It's something else. It it's a it's it, it's very something. Um, it it's, it just just goes straight to D here. I think people are a little bit. I think oh damn the fan is going off for some reason. I think people are a little bit too vocal about how bad the game is. Like people don't understand that this game was made by like a twelve year old and that was like her first it was a girl also and it was like her first time making ROM hacks. It's like I get you don't like the game is bad, but Jesus Christ, don't say death threats it's like yo it, it's like it's like people are like, oh don't hit on Emerald Kaizo, that's so unfair. Meanwhile, let's go send death threats to this twelve year old girl who made Dark Rising. I was like, what the hell's wrong with you people? And I was like, for its time, like Dark Rising, it, it had some qualities, it had some cool things going on with it, like, it's not, like, there's some fun to be had with it, but, good god, if you're trying to not suck this game, you better be hacking in some rare candies, and, like, some of it is just, like, like the eighth gym leader, what even is that, and the, the Elite Four with huge power of Regigigas with buff stats, and, Shadow Lugia on Super Saiyan steroids and this game is just something else. The starters are cool. I like the starters. There's like a rival fight every like second, every route. Probably at least one. 
the balancing is so whack. It's Emerald Kaizo, but way, way worse. Why would you play this over Emerald Kaizo? That's the thing with our And that is saying something, because I don't even like Emerald Kaizo that much. So that is saying something. The next game, now, this is going to be a very different kind of game, and this is where my criteria really comes into play. Adventure Red. Now, Mr. Ding Dong Games did make a video about this ages and ages ago. This game is at least a good game. And the reason why is because this game doesn't have that much replay value. It's not the best game for Nuzlocke King, it's not that hard. So these are traits that detract from the game. But what makes the game really good? The plot, the world building, the exploration, the characters, the music. These are all great. The game, it's like, it's basically just a complete adaptation of the manga. It's not completely accurate. In this manga, is a world where Pokemon is actually quite mature and adult. People get killed. There's actual, like, animal welfare concerns. People are genuinely evil. The game actually treats you like you're an adult. Which is something that I like. I don't want to be treated like I'm a stupid five-year-old. It's something that I really appreciate. There's also, like, some sexual content as well. That came from the manga. It talks about some real-world issues. It was something that, at the very least, it was entertaining. The characters were also quite entertaining. Rival Blue, like Rival Green from Fire Red, is here. And he is a good rival in this game. He actually has a character. He's a better written character than any of the mainline Pokemon games. He actually has a legitimate character arc, where he starts off is a complete douchebag. A complete greaseball. A pretty reprehensible person, but... He actually grows as a person and improves, and you can kind of see it happening. For example, at Lavender Tower in this game, which is like a very different area in this game, you see him and he does say, like, he says canonically, like, yes, my Radicate is dead, and he says, like, this is, like, I fucked up. My Pokemon died because I was careless, and I'm here to bury it. And after that, you actually see him change as a person, and at the end when you beat him before, like, the mainline story, he actually, like, grows, he actually respects you. And he act in during like the big um, self co team rocket arc, he actually kind of he shapes up and he actually becomes a hero. He starts off as an absolute douchebag that you hate, but he actually becomes a so when you root for a hero who learns from his mistakes, which is something that you just don't see in mainly Pokemon games. It's like Barry is like, oh I'm fast, that's it. Or it's like Wally, it's like, oh I'm a wimp, and then at the end of the game, he has one line of dialogue, oh I'm not a wimp anymore. Like yeah, I treat you like you're a five-year-old and you're too stupid to understand anything. Here, there's some stuff going on. Some of the villains were actually quite interesting. The gameplay was very basic, but I also really like, for example, the amount of side quests and exploits. The amount of content is insane. There's a humongous amount of content. Your mum is actually a character in this game, for example. It, it just has a lot of charm and character. So, the first time you play this game, it's really, really fun. But for nuzlocking in multiple playthroughs, not that fun. I understand. So I balance those things, and I think B tier is good. I might put like here, honestly, for Nuzlocking. I, I wouldn't play the game again, but the one time I did play it, it was very fun. Next up, Emerald Omega. I have this one Twitch viewer who just never shuts up about Emerald Omega. This game, I want to like this game. I really want to like Emerald Omega. Why? Because it's based off a of Fire Red Omega, which I adore. This Emerald Omega is based off of Fire Red Omega, but with Emerald, of course. But the game has a lot of issues. The balancing is really, really whack for Nuzlocke King. The AI has EVs. Why? Why do the AI have EVs in this game? I hate EVs. They're the most unfun mechanic in Pokemon. They should be removed. They just make it really grindy and annoying. And it makes it so, like, Nuzlocke King is ridiculously hard because of it. it. I don't think there's any way to actually remove the EVs. So if you want to play this game in Nuzlocke Rules, you're going to have to hack in vitamins and such, which is really obnoxious, because I don't think there's a good way of actually removing those. That's just really not fun. And the balancing is really off as well. Like the first gym leader, Rox Roxanne, is like a full sand team, and you have like level 15s. But what I do love about this game is that the starters, oh, Mag, B, L, can smooch them. Now, when I talk about Fire Omega, you'll know about that, but I love those starters, and I really love how this actually took after Fire Red Omega, which is great. I feel like the big issue with this game is that it's got, unlike other games, like Emerald Kaizo had so many problems, but 
The game got supported by its community and they actually helped fix some of the problems. Not enough, but at least they made like for example Docs and Calyx to make the game less unbearable. Emerald Omega has none of that. No streamlined patches or Calyx or Docs. But if the game, if I won't give the game benefit though, like if it did get supported, it would absolutely be better. But as of now, I'll put it probably like the mid, maybe I'd probably put it here, honestly, just because it has some of the things from Fire Red Omega. And speaking of Fire Red Omega, oh, this might actually be my favorite Drano hack. Now I know people will say Fire Red Omega, really? The game's that good? The game's old. Yes, it is old. The game is old. But the game has had a lot of impact in the ROM hacking community. I remember this this game has a sentimental value to me because it is the first ROM hack I've ever played, and it is the first Nuzlocke I've played, and the game is still good to this day. It's still a great game. It will be either very good or amazing. Now, okay, amazing, I can understand that probably is my bias kicking in, so I think very good is more reasonable. The game does have flaws, like the balancing is it is dated. It's, it's still Gen 3 though. But it has the charm that Gen 3 has. It's actually somewhat balanced during a physical special split. The biggest issue I had with this game, if I were to make, is that 50% of the monsters in this game are trash. And I do understand. The difficulty I feel is quite nice. If you're not using docks, I actually like the difficulty. I feel like it's pretty balanced. It is on the easier side for sure if you are using docks, that is sure. But um, what I like about the game. The starters are so good. I absolutely adore Mac B. Elkins Spectrum. They were so well implemented as starters in this game. They're so fun to use. They're a really big breath of fresh air. They feel like powerful mons that you actually get to use. And you actually like feel like a close connection to. And they're mons that you just never really get to use otherwise. I love how Elect the Buzz is actually a powerhouse this time. That's so awesome. And they really make sense from a lore perspective, because they're kind of like a trio that are like counterparts to each other. They're just awesome. They have their own the own charms them, I really like them. And um, I really like the post game E4. I like the game culminates with level 99 rival. And I really like how the post game Elite 4 they no longer focus on types, but they focus on themes. For example, Lorelei focuses on beauty themed Pokemon. Bruno focuses on offense. And Lance focuses on speed. It's just it's really nice. This game's a classic. I understand it might not be that amazing, but the game has a lot of charm. I'll put in very good below Volway 2 Redux because it's dated. Which is, a lot of people will disagree with me. But no one cares what they think, anyways. Pokemon Gaia. Fire Red Omega. Love Fire Red Omega. Pokemon Gaia. Um, this is kind of a hard one. The game wasn't that hard. I actually got a little bit bored of this game. It's not that hard. The bouncing is really off. Like, a lot of mons just suck. The The AI seemingly is random. The AI... The, the gym leader teams are just really unoptimized and really weird. That being said, you can't deny this game is a whole new region. This game is a whole new region. It, it really is a trailblazer. It's a trailblazer. It really is an original game. Its own plots, its own thing. A really big world. The thing is, this game isn't even complete. This game is actually getting an update, which is it's probably going to take a really long time for it to be finished. But this game is still getting more work done, so it could potentially go even higher on the list. But after... Though the game does have boring moments, like Mega Evolutions were really fun. After I admire the positives of the game, it, it's so ambitious and there's so much work done. After definitely use that as a point in its favour. I think good, high B tier is fair. I wouldn't put it that much higher. Some people I could totally understand why they might think it's an amazing game. I totally understand. Light Platinum. Mr. Ding Dong Games made a video in this game. It was definitely a meme. It was bad. I'm sorry, it's bad. A lot of people, they'll disagree with me. It's a bad game. The balance, this, this game has the most laughable balance I've ever seen. I remember when Mr. Ding Dong's Nuzlocke this game, he beat the Elite Four despite being like 15 levels below and he somehow still won. The 8th gym leader in this game has a Kingdra as the 8th Pokemon that uses Bubble. 
bubble on the eighth gym leader's wall. It has hydro pump, but it chooses to use bubble. What the? Why is the AI random? Why does it have bubble? What even is this game? The game just hands you overpowered mons every single route. It has fun point, like it has good things. It has really good things. The new world is really nice. The Safari Zone I remember was awesome. The post game is cool, but god the post game is like so unbalanced. The balance is just too bad. It's just too whack. Honestly, like there's a lot to like in this game. There is. Like the it's not as bad as Dark Rising, not like also it's not even that bad. Like the game has a lot of qualities. Like the amount of content exploration in post game, there's like a whole new region to explore in the tournaments, but it's just it's so dated and unrefined. Now there is a DS version of this, I believe. I think it might still be getting updated. There is a DS version of Light Platinum and it has some balance changes. That game could very well be much better. For sure. But as the Game Boy Advance version is now, it has to be low tier, I'm sorry. Um, Liquid Crystal, yes, Liquid Crystal, this game is, this is a hard game, this game is, it has so many good things, but so many bad things as well, there's a lot to like, the, the positives, it's a Gen 3 Jotal game, just like Crystal Dust, so it's pretty similar to that, so there's that to like, physical special splits, that's really nice. There's extra content, which is good and bad. Some of it is really dumb, but more content. Hey, I like more content in my games. I like more exploration, more things to do. And there's a lot more exploration in the main game. There are new areas you can serve to and new islands. That was really fun. It actually gives you new areas that you can go off the beaten track to go and find. It gives you new areas that you can go off on your own to explore, which I really like. It's not. It makes the game less linear. There's more, there's, there's more stuff to do outside of battling, which is really nice. The post-game content is unreal. You have the Kanto region, which has extra content on top of what was already there. And then there's a third post-game on top of that. There's literally like a big set of orange islands you can explore. But the balancing is so off, the AI is random. The game is ridiculously tedious. A lot of the new content is not implemented very well. You will literally see like the the champion with like fucking mud slap swamper and stuff like that. This game's not very fun to nuzlocke. If you're nuzlocking this game, hack in rare candies, please. And probably find a way to disable EVs. But it does have really good things in it as well. Like physical specials, but it, it's got better balance than crystal dust. I think it's better than crystal dust, honestly. Because I love the huge amount of content and I really want to like this game more. I genuinely had fun. Um, gym leader teams did get slightly changed, if I recall correctly. I really want to enjoy this game, but the problems just hold it back too much. You might still, it's definitely a, a, a still a good game to play. Next up, Unbound. I'm considering Unbound. Uh, you know this game, you know what it is. S tier or go to tier? I think go to tier. Yeah, go to the same reason why this game is here. It's a new game, a new world, a new plot. A completely original soundtrack, which is beautiful soundtrack. So many, in, in similar to this game here, it's a proper role-playing game. It's an actual role-playing game. There's, there's an actual side quest system. There's dialogue. There are choices to make in the game. There's actual plot. There are so many like side quests and optional areas you can go to, which is so fun. The soundtrack is incredible, it's so good. Especially this this one particular root soundtrack, which you're going to listen to now. I love the soundtrack. It actually makes me feel things, it's, it's so good. So many quality of life features like deck snapping. And this is before, I haven't even played the new Nuzlocke mode. The sandbox mode, which is made for Nuzlocking. So that's even more. This game is really it's really good for nuzlocking, it's really good for casual play. This game has everything you need. I would have preferred if EVs were taken out, but the way EVs are handled this game is really well done. The Elite Four and Champion are amazing. Really well done. 
absolutely love the unique gimmick. The gym leader is also incredibly well done. They have these really crazy gimmicks, which I think makes it. Gym leaders, lore wise, are supposed to be these crazy unique trainers, so ha giving them these well gimmicks is, is a very good idea. I'll probably put this here, but the game, there is so much love in this game. It's so well designed. It's a humongous world. The, the world map is really big. It's, it's just a full game. It's, it's like playing Skyrim. Like You're getting a full game with this. And there's post-game. There's more post-game being worked on right now. There's a big um, battle frontier as well. There's multiple difficulty modes. There's sandboxing. You can nuzlocke it. You can do what you want. It. It's wonderful. That's that's a like a not a very controversial take. A lot of people will agree with me on this. They won't disagree with me putting out this much above Emerald, but... <laughs> Blazing Emerald. I used to think this game was bad, honestly, but it's objectively not. I think top of good, or bottom of very good. One of those two. I would say bottom of very good, actually. That's a bit controversial. The reason why, this game, it's not the same game it was years ago. This game, the developer, I think his name is uh, Mr. Strudel, Mr. Strudel, Strudelman. He actually made an effort to improve this game and continuously update this game over the years and improve in all the criticism it got. Make the game more modern, adding in more mods, more regional forms, more moves, more balancing, more options, more things you can do in a game, and it really shows. It really makes the game that much better. There's more difficulty modes. There's lots of new moves, and the regional forms of this game are awesome. Hoenian forms, so good. It's, they're, they're so well designed. They look amazing. They look like official Pokemon. They look better than a lot of official mods. They look better than the garbage that was in Legends Arceus. A lot of that stuff sucked. Like, like that flipping Quillfish Evolution looks garbage. But not in this game. The mods here look really cool. And they make sense. A lot of them are really cool lore explanations for why they are the way they are. Like um, Hwenny and Maractus being a fire type because it got pushed out of the deserts into the volcano area. Which is really nice. The balancing can be a little bit off. Some of these mods are ridiculously overpowered. I remember the Reuniclus was absolutely brokenly strong. The difficulty is it's hard, but it's not ridiculously hard. But I think it's a good balance. There's a lot to enjoy. It's just Emerald with so many new features. Wonder trading. You, know. you can pick every starter to start off the game. Uh, all these new things. Modern features, physical special split. Obviously, there's an EV training area. Though I would prefer if EVs were just removed from this game because they're such a dumb mechanic. So much balancing. Gym leaders are really reworked. There's some new NPCs as well. It's it's just modern, ble modern Emerald, is great, it's with a lot of originality in it as well. So there's not a lot to like, and it's still getting more updates to this day. Nameless Fire Red. Um, this game is mid. It has okayish things. It has good features in the game. For its time, this game was great. It was. Absolutely. It, it, it was a very unique trailblazer for its time. Unique things like difficulty settings, Gen 6 mons, Gen 5 mons, really hard gym leaders, physical special split, infinite TMs, all these unique features, but just the game is so outdated. Why would you play this over Radical Red, which is this game but 10 times better? There are so many other games that do what this game does, just but better. The balancing on Insane mode was... Insane. <laughs> the opponents having EVs was a really bad mechanic. EVs are just not a fun mechanic, and I really did not like that. It's still a fine game, it's an okay game, but it's just so power crept by better games now. Speaking of better games, Radical Red, this is absolutely in goat tier. I don't know where exactly I would put this in relation to the others. I think I would probably do this. I think this. Radical Red. If you know me, you know I love Radical Red. This game, it's so well done. It's not trying to be a new world or a plot driven game. It knows what it wants to be. It wants to be Fire Red, but Boss Rush. Focus on the battles. It's like competitive showdown. It's focusing on competitive, hard fights. Where the game gives you everything, the opponents have everything, and you go at it. Whoever has the best strategy wins. And it does it so well. 
The game is completely optimized. Minimal grinding mode is one of the best things to have ever happened in Pokemon. It really is. Restricted mode. Hardcore mode. This game has it all. Restricted mode is so fun. People say restricted, restricted mode is too easy. It sucks. It's too no shut up. You still need to use your brain. It's still harder than like Drano ROM hacks. In the Elite Four, restricted mode is still hard. To put it in perspective, people made a humongous deal when Pokemon Challenges beat Radical Red ages ago, but the restricted mode that's out now is significantly harder than what he did. And I basically and I made it to the champion in restricted mode. So I made it to the champion with only three mons and then I went to the champion because of random AI, which was annoying, but the game was so enjoyable. There are so many mons, the buffs are incredible. So many mons are useful. This game just shows you a lot of stuff about Pokemon that you never knew existed. You get to use all these Gen 8 mons, it's so ahead of its time. Hisuian forms are being added in, that's awesome. New moves, new abilities, like Monkey Gorilla Mode, that is so awesome. Monkeys get get like Gorilla Tactic, that's so awesome. I really like it. It makes the Elemental Monkeys good. So, so Some of these buffs are awesome. Aegis Slash is overpowered even after getting nerfed. But mons like Mightyena are actually really useful for once. Fur is pretty good. So many mons are useful. Wonder Eggs are making this game so fun to Nuzlocke. Mega Evolution. All oh, the Mega Forms in this game are awesome. The best Mega Evolutions of any Pokemon game. I absolutely adore the new, brand new Mega Evolutions. Like Mega Butterfree and Mega Kingler. A lot of them were really underpowered, but I really appreciate I really like Mega Orbeetle. I love how the developer went out of the way to give Orbeetle its own Mega Evolution. Granted, it was kind of unbalanced and it really should have been stronger, but... It's really cool, and I really like the idea of like the Dynamax form. It's like the new the Gigantamax is the new Mega Evolution. That's really cool. The champion, the boss fights, the Elite Four, they're really awesome. In hardcore mode, this is the big point about why Emerald Kaizo is so low in the tier list. Hardcore mode of Radical Red exists. Now, Radical Red hardcore mode, it's like the same difficulty as Emerald Kaizo. If you played hardcore mode, you'll know it's at least equivalent, roughly, to Emerald Kaizo. But it has all the conveniency changes that Radical Red has in minimal grinding mode. Now, why would I play Emerald Kaizo, which I said is a complete slog to play. No one with a life won't do it. Why would I play Emerald Kaizo when Radical Red Hardcore mode exists? The same difficulty, but just a much better game. Much more convenience. I can actually play it around my other things I do in life. Emerald Kaizo is a game that you have to sit down for 5 hours just to make a bit of progress. Radical Red, no. You can actually like do the first, like, in one day you can do the first half of the game. Like, I think one time I went from back to Erica on hardcore mode, Nuzlocke, in one day and I only lost one mon. Strategy is a really big thing in Radical Red, the game gives you so many options. It's really fun. It doesn't have as much of the BS that Emerald Kaizo has. There isn't that much like Shadow Tag and Self Destruct and Quick Claw. The only RNG I would say in the game is that sometimes the AI, we don't fully understand how the AI works. In one hand, the AI is not abusable like it was before, so it's really good. Like, you can't just intimidate the AI to minus six and just get a shell armor mon and PB stods. No, the AI is actually smarter than that. But at the same time, because we don't fully understand how the AI works, it is really confusing. Sometimes the AI will do something that just does not make sense, which can be frustrating. I understand that. And the only real complaint I have, especially with hardcore mode, not so much restricted mode, is that because the game is hard, it's extremely hard, you will be using the same mons almost every single run. You're always going to get, like, you're a good starter, you need to reset for certain mons, you need to get the guaranteed magic arc, you need to get the guaranteed lantern for this day, and you're just using very similar mons every single run, you're always going to get Aegislash. Slash. It does take away a little bit of the replay value. Now, on restricted mode, it's not an issue, but. And also, because of the minimum grinding mode, every mon is the same every single time, which is good, but it also takes away a little bit of replay value. That's the only issue. However, the big point about this game that I haven't even mentioned yet is that this game is being updated to version 2.4. In 2.4, wow, it looks like an amazing change. You're going to be able to pick every single starter from Gen 1 to Gen 8. Mons are being rebalanced so everything is viable. It really improves the balancing of our hardcore mode. Which kind of alleviates some of the issues I even had with this. 
So it was not to love with Radical Red. People like to talk smack about Radical Red for some reason, but... I don't know, maybe they're just Emerald Kaizo fanboy or something. I don't know what they're talking about. But yeah, most people would agree this game is goated. It's goated with the sauce. It is. Radical Red Time. Mm -hmm. Good game. <laughs> Sorry for making you cringe. <sighs> what the? F what is it? This big cum pile of cum. There's a big pile of cum here. Snakeweed. But yeah, Snakeweed is bad. <laughs> it's just. I don't know if it's Dark Rising Kaizo bad. It's, it might even be worse than Dark Rising. Actually, I played Dark Rising Kaizo too. I should probably put that on the list and screw that. Snake Root is just. It's not even bad to the point it's funny. It's just like, what even is this? I tried Nuzlocke in the game, it was not fun. The game takes forever. There's so much random jank you have to do and stuff that just makes no sense. It's, the game is just. Like, what even was this game? I didn't even play that far into it. Yeah, I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I, I really didn't. Some people might like it, I understand. But it's not for me. Storm Silver. Hmm. Storm Silver. This is controversial, but I think Storm Silver is Driano's worst ROM hack. I think it is. Storm Silver, I, I truly believe, is Driano's wor weakest ROM hack. It, it's dated. It's like Fire Red Omega, but without the charm that Fire Red Omega has. All the problems that were in. Well, a lot of the problems that were in the base. Heart Glow and Soul Silver, which the base had a lot of problems. Only some of them were fixed. Like, yes, the linearity problem was fixed. And the level curves being absolutely BS was fixed. But that was it. The mods are still horribly balanced. The difficulty is really whack. The grinding is absolutely obnoxious in this game. And even if you act in rare candies, there's still like a lot of like annoying busy work you have to do. And just things that weren't updated that should have been updated. The Elite Four and Champion were okay, but the post-game rematch was really disappointing. The post-game felt a bit boring, even though there's a huge amount of content. You'd think I would really like it. I don't know, I, I, I just wasn't that big of a fan of it, honestly. It just feels like the weakest Triano ROM hack. Fire Red, at least, was way more convenient to play. And I feel like it had better balancing, too. It had more engaging fights. Storm still, it's still a good game. Like, absolutely, it's still a good game, but... It's not a great game, that's the thing. Now, when the game gets updated to um, version 2, like the remake, I, well, I'm sure it will be great, I'm, I'm sure it will. But, it's an old game, it has a lot of flaws, but it's it's still it's still an enjoyable game. Some people will like it a lot more. I'll put it below Vote White 2, though I think the difference between these is, is very small. One thing I will preface is that, though these are ordered, the difference between each increment, increment is usually very like very very small like, the difference between these three games is very small it's almost negligible they're still ordered but some of these games have such a small difference between them speaking of Driano vote white 2 or no vote white 1 I'm getting tired man How, this has been going on for ages holy smokes well at least we have uh, in-depth discussion vote white 1 from Driano this is probably one of my favorite Driano Games. I, I really enjoy this. Now, the game has flaws. The balancing is a bit whack. Vault White 1 has the most unforgiving early game I've seen. It's so, like, Lenora is the most ludicrous gym fight I've seen in a Pokemon game. It's a double fight at level 20 where she has a Retaliate Buffalon with Sap Zipper. Like, her whole team sp spams Retaliate, which is basically a 140 base power stab move, and you're here with level 20s, like... Oh... What? It's probably Drown was hard as ROM hack, I would say. Like, maybe on par with, like, Blaze Black. Blaze Black 2 Redux is, is harder now. I would say this game is probably at the bottom end of very good. Maybe a bit more than, than Blazing Emerald. It does have a lot of the charm that Gen 5 has. And it's one of Giano's more modern ROM hacks, so a lot of mods are actually really viable. Things like Watchhog and Pidgeot, for example, are actually pretty good. It does pretty well with bouncing. It's just some boss fights are just a little bit ridiculous. But a lot of the fights actually feel pretty balanced and pretty fair. I really like the abundance of double battles, triple battles, rotation. Though 
rotations are really they were not implemented very well in this game because if you played this game you will know that in rotation battles the ai is completely random the ai literally clicks random bu buttons and that is just not fun to play against because when you're doing a rotation battle you have to prepare for 12 different possible moves that could hit you and that's just like it's just a dice roll it's not fun but um there's a lot to enjoy this game i think uh, the starters are really cool i like how the starters are really balanced they're, they're all really strong samrot was pretty lackluster but the other two starters were really strong Burgatory is a thing. Gang Pass Burg is very hard in this game, but once you do, the game becomes very manageable. The early game balancing could be a lot better. That was like the main issue people had, and the Elite Four rematch could be better. The Elite Four rematch was actually a lot easier than the main game one, but the main game Elite Four was really well done. Double Battle Elite Four was so good. The AI was random though. That was the big issue. Gen Five AI was the one thing holding this game back, but. The double battle E4 was really nice. I, I really enjoyed it. There was a lot to like. Renegade Platinum. Renegade Platinum. It is here. It is probably the best Giano Raw Mac. Now, I don't know where this recent trend of people hating on Renegade Platinum comes from. They're, they're probably Emerald Kaizo fanboys. People are like starting to hate on Emerald on Renegade Platinum recently. And I really don't understand why. People h hate on it because they, they think the game is too easy. Because they think, oh, it's just like the same arguments that I make with Emerald Kaiser. Oh, difficulty equals good. A game is good because it's hard. If a game is not hard, it's it's garbage. No, that, that's just not true. Renegade Platinum, it's not even that easy. If you're playing a game without docks, and you're playing a game without calcing, you're just like, not looking at it normally. The game can have some challenge. Absolutely, and you'll have to ban some things and remove some EVs, but the game is very enjoyable. In terms of quality, I truly believe Renegade Platinum is still the best main Drano ROM hack. The streamlining, the balancing, the boss fights, the post-game content, it all works. It, it just works. It's so polished. There's even a speed-up patch, which is really good. Everything in this game just flows together. It fixed all the problems that the original Platinum had. The post game is really fun. You get access to this new island with six gym leaders that are spread throughout the island, which you can go and battle at your own will. And it's just non linear. It's really fun. And then you re challenge the Elite Four, where Cynthia has a re quasa, and then there's even more stuff to do on top of that. The gym leader, I mean, the Elite Four, the Elite Four have four different teams which get selected at random. That is such a good option. It really adds a lot of replay value, especially if you're not using docks. Because you don't know what you're going to go up against. And that is cool. Playing as Renegade Platinum without docks is good. You don't have to use docks all the time. You know, you, you can play Nuzlocks. Nuzlocks are about having fun, not just about, oh, well, let me measure my dick by playing a really hard game. No, I want to have fun. I want to play a game with a lot of good features, exploration, that's pretty hard, but not too hard. Some non-linearity. And this game has it. It's got a really good balance. I really, the replay value is very good in this game, that's one thing that, that really sets Renegade Platinum out apart from other games, the replay value. Unlike Radical Red, we just get the same stuff every time, here you can get, especially if you ban gift mons, you can get so many different encounters and it probably has one of the most balanced meta games that I've seen of any one hack. So many things are useful, Pidgeot, Radicate, Machena, for it is like not so much, but in the first route, like the Barrel, Needles, Dodo, almost everything is viable almost every mon is really useful with only some exceptions if you want to play with evs also you can ev train i would not re i would recommend just removing evs from the game completely and try not to abuse things like setup because that's really dumb and probably ban substitutes because that is really dumb but there's a lot to like about this game i, I think it's just very good it takes all the boxes and I guess like Platinum is just a very good game also. I remember being this game for the first time without using docks. And when I heard that credit soundtrack, it got me emotional, especially when I beat post game, which I really enjoyed. I finally I beat Cynthia again and this time she had a Requaza. And it was such an experience. I did not have any docks. I did not know what I was up against. And I still won. And seeing that credit soundtrack, 
after truly beating the game. Oh, it was it gave me the feels. It really did. And even after that, there's like an extra. There's even more stuff to do after post game. Like there's a twenty trainer gauntlet, which you're going to wipe it most likely. But there's just even more to do. It's just it's such a well made game. It stands the test of time. It's Triano's most streamlined, polished piece of work. And it's not overrated at all. It's really not. I don't know what people are talking about. Maybe if you're like one of those elitist nuzlockers who feel the need to measure your dick or like your life revolves around nuzlocking and you have to play hard games just for the sake of playing hard games, maybe. But if you want to play a good game, like an actual role-playing game, Renegade Platinum's good. Player choice, replay value, exploration, difficulty, it's got it all. Next up is a Pokemon Challenges Trash Lock, and this is Mr. Ding Dong Games thumbnail because the box art doesn't actually exist in there's no official box art for this game. This game I've played, um, it's kind of a hard one to say. I didn't think the game was too fun, entertaining to play. That being said, I really respect the game and I really like the idea that I did. It's a, it's, I don't think the game is as fun as you would think. Yes, it sounds like a really fun idea, but the game actually gets kind of boring. The reason why it is still Vanilla Emerald at the end of the day, but playing with trash mons, like the whole point of the game is you're playing with garbage mons, it's nowhere near as fun as you would think. In fact, playing with trash mons is actually really frustrating. These mons are really fun. You have to play with a, a Sea King that gets no water moves. That's just not fun. Or like a Macargo, which can't really do anything. You're playing with mons that just do nothing. And a lot of it can be really frustrating. Because like... It feels just too restrictive. It feels like I can't do anything in this game. All the mons that you get are mons that are just really underbalanced, or mons that just have no good moves. And these are the mons that I always avoided in other Pokemon games. I feel like a trash lock would be so much better in like Gen Five, or like physical special split and like move set buffs for actually a thing. And it is just vanilla Pokemon at the end of the day. So it, some people will like it for sure. Like, there are some mods like Grumpig and Electrode and Octillery, which you can certainly use, and they're not so bad. But, like, there are some good things, but there are also some boring things, but I really respect the game for what it is, so... Maybe here, I would say? Like, I don't even know, to be honest, like... It's really hard. I would say somewhere here, but it's really hard to say. Now, well... Arguably the two best games have been saved for last. First of all, I will be talking about this game, Primeval Black 2, and this might take a while. There's a lot to say about this game. So, first of all, most of these will not know what this game even is. So what is it? Well, this is a game that's currently in beta. It's a spiritual successor to Vintage White. So if you know Vintage White, this game is a game based off of Pokemon Black and White 2, but it is made by a different developer. It's kind of like what Dark Souls is to Demon Souls. It carries over a lot of the same design philosophy that Vintage White had. If you want to know more about this game, which I really recommend, you can go into DRXX's Discord, because that's where the game's being developed in, and you can actually speak to the creator there. He's still updating and improving the game and finishing the game as we speak, so you can even speak to him. I've spoken to him quite a bit. That's actually pretty cool, but... Even though this game is in beta and only the first half of the game is complete, Primeval Black 2 is amazing as is, and I seriously think this game has potential to be my favourite ROM hack, and it's an incredible sleeper. So, what does this game do? Well, it's kind of like Vintage White, where it has a little bit of a twist in the gimmick, so you the player can only use Generation 1 to 3 Pokemon, but the AI only uses Generation 4 to 5, so it's like this theme of old generation Pokemon versus new generation Pokemon. It also carries over a lot of the crazy balancing that Vintage White had, like Electro-type Pidgeot, and Water-type Magcargo actually is a poison type in this game. L lots of really crazy changes that really tries to make everything balanced. The game's difficulty, it's harder than Vintage White, but easier than Emerald Kaizo, but also has a lot of incredible quality of life changes that I really like. For example, 
The game just flat out gives you infinite rare candies and infinite repels, and it gives you all the items that you need without having to hack them in. That is amazing. And this kind of leads into my best point about Primeval Back 2. Unlike Emerald Kaizo, this game is made by a Nuzlocker for Nuzlockers. The game is playtested by lots of Nuzlockers, including myself, and is made to be as streamlined as possible. When this game was first released as a beta, it was harder than Emerald Kaizo, the difficulty was insane, but after literally 30 different beta updates, the game is so much more manageable and balanced and enjoyable now. The developer has really gone out of his way to make this game more balanced and playable and is really taking in a lot of the feedback, and this game is just getting better and better. One thing I really like about this game, this meta idea, is that Professor Juniper, who's technically the developer himself speaking, he or she actually lays out the rule set to you when you start the game. Charge my laptop. Professor, Professor, sorry. Professor Juniper actually lays out the rule set for you to use. The developer actually tells you in the opening of the game, if you're going to nuzzle this game, use these rules. First of all, stay within the level caps, obviously. But for hidden grotos, try to use one hidden groto for every four gym badges. So that's pretty good. The developer's actually giving you the optimized rule set for this game. And another rule set that he implemented that I really, really like is to complete this Nuzlocke, you have to do post-game, which is something that I really love, and more games should be doing this. In lots of games like Vintage White and Renegade Platinum, post-game was my favourite part of the game. It's just bigger, better battles, more content on the game that I already really enjoyed, a lot more stuff to do, very enjoyable, but most people just ignore it, and especially when I do it, most people just say it doesn't matter, which is kind of unfortunate, especially because post-game is a big chunk of the game that developer actually put a lot of effort in. Here you're actually required to do it, and the game is just going to keep on progressing after you beat the champion the first time. Which I think is, is a really good feature, and more games should do it. I really, really like how this game handles its design philosophy and balancing. I really like this idea of exploration, which I think is probably handled better in this game, better than any other game I've played, and it's a really good idea that more games should be doing for Nuzlocke King. This idea of exploration in risk versus reward and meaningful decisions. For example, right before Berg in Gym 3 in Primeval Black 2, the game gives you several branching paths and options, each with their own risk and reward. So you can go straight to the main storyline and go to do Berg. Or there's a few other options. You can go to Route 4, and if you go to Route 4, before Berg, you can go and get an extra encounter, but to get your extra encounter in Route 4, you have to fight a very hard trainer who at that point in the game is basically just a mini boss. So you have to fight this mini boss to get an encounter that's going to be pretty good for Berg. You can also go to Relic Castle, where you can also go to Relic Tunnel. You can also go to Relic Tunnel, where you also have to fight a pretty difficult trainer to get past before Berg. But you do get an encounter that's a rock type, so it's pretty good for Berg. Or you could just take your chances against Berg now, and then just beat the mini bosses afterwards when you're much higher level. The game does this a lot. Before Elisa, I believe there's four different areas where you can go to, where you have to, for example, fight a pretty hard trainer, but you get something that's really good for that gym. It's a really good idea of risk versus reward, and I believe like like Dark Souls, for example, does pretty well. Especially Dark Souls 1 when you start the game and you have access to all the areas instantly. You as a player have to decide what you're going to do, which route are you going to take. Is it worth going to this harder area? Maybe I can do it. Maybe I should just ignore it for later when I'm higher level. I think this is really engaging. Rather than just a standard Pokemon game which is just super linear, just keep going forward, keep fighting this trainer, then this route. Here it's like, no. You actually get choices, and your choices will really matter, and it creates a lot of replay value, different decisions, and a lot of like discussion with other players, which is really good. It's very enjoyable. The gym battles in this game are 
some of the best designed gym battles I've seen. It's basically Emerald Kaizo but less frustrating. The gym fights, there's single battles, double battles, triple battles. They're very hard, yes, but the game purposely makes sure you have what you need to counter them. And a lot of the battles, they revolve around very clever strategies and themes. For example, Renegade Platinum is good, but most of the trainers in that game were so simple. It's just, here's a strong mod that you have to fight, it's got dual stab move and two coverage moves and that's it. In Primeval Back 2, a lot of the trainers are very creative. You can fight weather teams, you can fight stall teams, you can fight triple battles where the opponent specialises in pivoting strategies. You can fight teams that set specialise in setup strategies, for example, or try to use evasion effects, or try to do really weird stuff like, for example, counter. There's a lot of different themes and different kinds of opponents you have to fight, which I think is really interesting. It's a puzzle... It's basically the puzzle-solving element that Emerald Kaizo had, but way less frustrating because there's not as many battles as in Emerald Kaizo because base Black and White 2 just doesn't have that many trainers in. It's not quite as hard. This game is what Emerald Kaizo should have been, but in Gen 5. So, it, like, I hope I've sold you in this game, but you can try out the beta or you could just wait until the game actually comes out, which I think I'm going to do. But this is definitely somewhere nice here, I, I really think. Primeval Black 2, it's such a slept on game. I think it has potential to absolutely be better than Renegade Platinum or even Golded here. I truly think so. Finally, after all that, speaking of go to tier, the final game, Vindub, Pokemon Vintage White. This is absolutely one of my favourite Pokemon games I've played, no question. It's absolutely in go to tier. It might, where exactly in go to tier? I think probably on the lower end, but honestly the difference between the placements of these mods within the tiers is extremely small to negligible. Vintage White is a controversial game. People either love it or they hate it. I adore this game. It is one of my favourite games. I've nuzzled this game six times. I've done post game twice. I've played this game inside out. I made a two and a half hour tier list explaining every single mod you can get in that game. It's so well designed. This game, it's such a trailblazer in the Nuzlocke community. This game, which is, it was made by Pokemon Challenges moderator. The developer, he had a lot of balls with this game. Like, it's so based. He really took risks with this game and implemented some pretty crazy changes. It knows what it wants to be. It's not trying to be plot driven or anything, but it's just focusing on gameplay and balancing, and it does it so well. Probably my favourite thing about Vintage White is the balancing. It's so good. Almost Every single Pokemon in this game is viable to some extent. The changes are crazy. The lineup of you only using Generation 1 to 3 Pokemon is good because every mod you can get is very usable, everything is niche. Getting counters is just such an exciting experience, and you can play this game so many times and have a unique experience each time. The balancing is just perfect. This game is in between Volt White and Emerald Kaizo in terms of difficulty, so the difficulty is perfect. It's hard. But it's not unfair. I feel like um, the first three gym leaders are actually some of the best designed gym leaders of any game in terms of difficulty scaling. Lenora, for example, is like the first hard gym leader. It's perfectly designed. She has a very powerful team, but the game makes sure that you can deal with her as long as you play properly. It's it feels completely fair and is really enjoyable. Some of the mons are so fun to use, like Electro-type Pidgeot, Fighting-type Dugtrio, which is kind of crazy, Dragon-type Septile Technician, Dark-type Fero. It's so creative. And I played post-game twice, and post-game was also super enjoyable, because in that point of the game, the game really opens up. So it's no longer like, oh, you have to go here and do this, go in a straight line later. No, once you beat the game, the post-game's unlocked. The game basically just goes, here's everything else you can do in the game, all this new content, all this new area, you delete four rematches here, there's some boss fights here, just, you can now catch generation four and five Pokemon which are locked by in post game. And the game just lets you do whatever you want in any order, which is something that I had a lot of fun with. 
And Vintage White is also one of the only good Generation 5 ROM hacks. Full White is fine, but Vintage White is so much better than Full White and it fixes almost all the issues that game had. Part of it I will say is sentimental value, I just have an attachment towards Vintage White. Fun fact, I've actually created a lot of strategies that are currently being used in Vintage White and I'm also responsible for getting a lot of things banned from that game because every time I beat Vintage White, uh, I've actually spoken to the guy who made the game quite a lot. He would like see what I did in that run and he would just ban the most broken stuff I abused so yeah that was funny. I have so many fond memories of this game, coming up with strategies. Yes, there is planning involved, but it's not that time consuming. There are a few gauntlets, but it's nowhere near as much as Emerald Kaizo. I do I will say if you want to play really, really hard ROM hacks like Emerald Kaizo and Radical Red Hardcore mode, Vintage White is a very good starting point. Vintage White is like the bridge between Driano ROM hacks and Kaizo games. It's very hard but also very fair at the same time, so I'd recommend it. So go to tier. It's just a game that I have fond memories. Most people would put it a little bit lower, which is understandable. So, with that established, here's the tier list. Are there any changes I would make after considering this? Honestly, Fire Red Omega, I would think I would put at the very top here. Vote White, any other changes? It's hard to see. I think this placement here looks solid, honestly. Now, obviously the difference between a lot of these placements are very small and there definitely can be some leeway. And I totally understand that many people will have their own opinions and, for example, a lot of people would really like Emerald Kaizo and I, un I understand why people might like Emerald Kaizo, but I just don't. So, yeah, that's pretty much the tier list done and feel free to potentially even debate me in the comment section, I'll definitely be there. A lot of people will have things they want to say and things they want to add. As long as you don't get really salty and butt hurts, it'll actually be pretty fun. And I really enjoy this tier list. I'm actually quite happy with how this tier list turned out because I said at the beginning of my tier list, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm ranking, and this is what I'm ranking off of to try and avoid any confusion. And I make sure to spend as much time as I need to to explain every game and why I'm placing it exactly where I am, and what each game's qualities and negatives are. Most people in the tier list, they're just, they're so bare bones, just like, this game, oh yeah, it's a good game, it's a good game, I like it, it's really awesome, put it in C tier, I'm like, okay, they don't really go into that much detail. I hope I've taught you something, and maybe I've influenced your opinions, and even if you disagree with me, you know, maybe you've got some food for thought. So with that done, let me know what you think in the comment sections, maybe I could do more tiers in the future. Thank you all for watching, this is Chadalicious, signing out baby.